Hello, and welcome members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Our names are Ammon, Topher, and Micah, and together we are the Three Brothers. Brothers. Brothers, brothers, and we're coming at you this week again with the Come Follow Me discussion, where we will give you our favorite insights, and then we'll talk about them. Who's next? Is that my turn? Hello! That's right. And as always, everything we talk about is free, because we're the free brothers. Uh, you'll find linked below the Rickley Weedings document, which is the document that we use to study from because it's fantastic. Uh, that has the Come Follow Me manual for the week in black, the scriptures for the week in gold, and the other church manuals in purple, all in a nice collated order. So you don't have to go looking elsewhere. You can just read the document and you get all the best stuff the church has to, has to offer on, on uh, the scriptures this week. And uh, you'll also find linked the insights that we talk about in this video as well. We thank Ashley for putting that document together and uh, Ashley or others for uploading it to our YouTube channel. You'll find that there uh, hopefully now. And um, if you prefer to just listen or um, yeah, listen to it on YouTube rather than reading it in a document, go for it. It's on, it's on YouTube as well. And that's what we do here. That's why we're here. Let's roll. Let's do it. Okay. I just got a big one. It's thick. You will need a strap in. But I just had to do it this week. <laughs> I had to do it. Okay. From the introduction in the student, Matthew. <laughs> Mike is dying. From the introduction in the student manual, it says... The Book of Ether's account of the tragic destruction of a once great nation helps us see the inevitable consequences of rejecting the prophets and the devastating results of unrestrained sin. In contrast, we also read some profound instruction on faith in Jesus Christ. The combined teachings of the prophets Ether and Moroni demonstrate that faith leads to repentance, brings about miracles, and turns personal weakness into strength. Sadly, the Jaredites refused to heed Ether's teachings and turned away from the truth that could have saved them. Now, this is the kicker. As you read Ether chapters 12 to 15, ask yourself the question, what lessons are there in these chapters for me and the generation I live in? Now, man, I... Gee, that question hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was just thinking to myself the whole time, like, man, I, I am obsessed with the concept at the moment of the work that this rising generation needs to accomplish. I am obsessed with it. And I want the young people of our church to understand it. I want them to know who they are. I want them to understand what they're born to do. I have a lot to think about when it comes to how these scriptures affect the generation that I live in. And so I want to take you on a little journey. And this is not new information, but we have to go on this journey again together about this generation. So what are the le lessons for our generation? How can we even know if any of these things taught in Ether's, Ether chapters 12 to 15 have anything to do with our generation? Maybe they relate to a generation 100 years from now, 50, uh, 80, 100 years, 200 years from now. But what do these t chapters actually teach us about? What is in them first? In the student manual, it says the New Jerusalem. Ether chapter 13 describes what a great seer Ether was. Ether was shown many marvelous things by the Lord, including the establishment of a new Jerusalem prior to the second coming. Note what Ether said about the new Jerusalem. One, that it would be a holy sanctuary of the Lord. Two, it would be built on the American continent for the remnant of the seed of Joseph. Three, it would be a holy city like the Jerusalem built unto the Lord. Four, it would stand until the earth is celestialized. So in other words, if you can get yourself there, that'd be the place to be. Five, it would be a city for the pure and righteous. I like that because it also answers the question, will everybody be able to go? And the answer is clearly no. So that's what Ether, that's, this is what Ether was teaching in these chapters. So what, what has the New Jerusalem got to do with, this, with our generation? The New Jerusalem sounds amazing, 
And this is something that we want to be part of, obviously. You want to be the pure and righteous. You you want to be with the Lord. Uh, this is in the American continent. It's going to be the sanctuary of the Lord. It sounds great, but how do we know the timing? How do we know it's not 200 years from now? How do we know the generation in which the new Jerusalem will be established? Well, we can know. In Doctrine and Covenants section 45, it is the Lord's timeline of events and the timing of his second coming which includes the establishment of the New Jerusalem. Let's see what we can learn from the Savior himself about the timing. In section 45, 24 and 25, it says, And this I have told you concerning Jerusalem. And when that day shall come, shall a remnant be scattered among all nations. But they shall be gathered again, but they shall remain until the gen times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So what is, it, what is the times of the Gentiles then? Because it happens in that generation. So what is the times of the Gentiles? Luke chapter 21 verse 24 is the only place where the phrase times of the Gentiles appears in the Bible. The phrase also appears in three times in Latter-day Revelation. In New Testament times, the gospel was preached first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. In the latter days, the message of the restored gospel is first to go to the Gentile nations and then to the Jews. The period of time when the Gentiles have precedence in receiving the gospel is called the times of the Gentiles. So the times in which the Gentiles receive the gospel, it's our time. Once that's fulfilled, then it goes to the Jews. Pretty simple. Now, we want to know whether or not that time period has been fulfilled. President Joseph Fielding Smith stated in 1966, The times of the Gentiles commenced shortly after the death of our Redeemer. The Jews soon rejected the gospel, and it was then taken to the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles have continued from that time until now. President Smith, Smith spoke further about the fulfillment of the times of the Gentiles. Jesus said the Jews would be scattered among all nations, and Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles were, were fulfilled. The prophecy in section 45 verses 24 to 29 of the Doctrine and Covenants regarding the Jews was literally fulfilled. Jerusalem, which was trodden down by the Gentiles, is no longer trodden down, but is made the home of the Jews. They are returning to Palestine. And by this, we may know that the times of the Gentiles are near their close. So we know that that prophecy has been fulfilled. In 1966, the president of the church was saying that it had been fulfilled. The Jews are returned to their homeland and they continue to, to return. It is now fulfilled. It hasn't ended, but it has been fulfilled. And therefore, that part of the prophecy has been fulfilled. Now, the fulfillment happened before 1966. You could say that it happened in 1948. On, the, on May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion, the head of the Jewish agency, proclaimed the establishment of the state of Israel. U.S. President Harry S. Truman recognized the, the new nation on the same day. So it happened around that period of time, 1948 but certainly preceding 1966. So if we simply look at the date that this prophecy was fulfilled, late 40s into the 60s, we will know the generation that we're talking about here. So who fits the 1940s to 1960s generation? Well, that is smack bang in the middle of the baby boomers generation. So we've, we've, now that our minds are crystal clear here on the generation, which is the baby boomers that we're talking about, let's discuss the signs of the second fu second fulfillment of the prophecy shared by Jesus. Let's talk about exactly what this generation would witness. In short, we will focus on those contained in Doctrine and Covenants 45. Now, when discussing the effects of COVID-19 on the church, President Nelson stated the following. Often when the Lord warns us about the perils of the last days, he counsels thus, stand ye in holy places and be not moved. Now, we know President Nelson was a heart surgeon professionally, and he approaches his talks and references with the same surgical precision. Rather than simply referencing Doctrine and Covenants 4532 about standing in holy places, he chose to reference verse 31 about the desolating sickness. And thus, because his talk was focused on the effects of COVID-19, and he ref referenced specifically the de desolating sickness in verse 31, we know that he is talking about COVID-19 being the desolating sickness. Therefore, this generation, the baby boomers, 
would live to see COVID-19 occur towards the end of their lives. Some of them would still remain alive to witness every event of the second coming. Now, it's important to note that the youngest, the youngest of this generation, born in 1948, the time that the Gentiles began to be fulfilled around that time, are now 76 years old. The average life expectancy in the United States of America is 77.5 years old. This means that the majority of the baby boomers will have passed away in the next 12 months. Is it any wonder President Nelson recently stated, using a baseball analogy, we are in the last half of the of the ninth inning? Now a quick recap. We go to DNC 45. And in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Boom, 1948, certainly before 1966, done. And there shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass until they sh shall see an overflowing scourge, for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. Desolating sickness happened in 2020. Done. But my disciples shall stand in holy places and shall not be moved. But among the wicked, men shall lift up their voices and curse God and die. We saw men doing that with the counsel from the prophet and throwing the prophet under the bus lifting their voices against God, and and they are dying in their sins, if not literally. And we've seen the others that are following the prophets making themselves holy, sanctifying themselves, and standing in holy places. Done. And there shall be earthquakes but also in diverse places and many desolations. Yet men will harden their hearts against me, and they will take up the sword one, one against another, and they will kill one another. Well, we are seeing a record number of earthquakes, a record number of wars, and we are seeing people killing each other all over the world. Done. And now when I, the Lord, had spoken these words unto my disciples, they were troubled. And I said unto them, Be not troubled, for when all these things shall come to pass, ye may know that the promises which have been made unto you shall be fulfilled. So the only part of this section of Doctrine and Covenants 45 that is yet to be fulfilled is the Lord is saying that when you see these things, that's when I'm going to keep my promise to the, the house of Israel. So what is the promise made to the house of Israel? Third Nephi chapter 20. And it shall come to pass that I will establish my people, O house of Israel. And behold, this people will I establish in this land unto the fulfilling of the covenant, which I made unto your father Jacob. And it shall be a new Jerusalem. And the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people. Yea, even I will be in the midst of you. So all of these timelines, timeline events have been fulfilled. The generation that needs to live to see the promises made to the house of Israel, which is the establishment of Zion, is at the end of their average life expectancy. The mo majority of them will be gone in the next 12 months. So if there has not been enough war or not been enough earthquakes, etc., then they are going to have to happen really quickly because time is up. Their generation is coming to an end. And so if we know how close we are, then which gem uh, close we are, then which generation will predominantly be involved in the actual process of the establishment of Zion? If the baby boom generation will live to see it, but they'll almost be dead by the time it happens, then who is going to do these things? Who is going to be the generation? Who is going to be the ones that establish Zion that do these things? Doctrine and Covenants section 101. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto one of his servants, Joseph Smith, Jr., go and gather together the residue of my servants and take all the strength of mine house, which are my warriors, my young men, and they that are of middle age also. Note, specifically not the elderly. We're talking Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z maybe, and anything after that if they're old enough, if there's still time. Among all my servants who are of the house of who are the strength of mine house, save only those whom I have appointed to tarry. And go ye, go ye straightway unto the land of my vineyard and redeem my vineyard, for it is mine. I have bought it with money. He's telling these young and middle-aged men to go and redeem the land of Zion. But Ammon, this is crazy talk. You're a crazy man. You're a crazy person. If this was true and the rising generation was supposed to redeem and establish Zion, the one we're talking about right now, at the current generation was supposed to do this. Our leaders would be all over this. Our leaders would be talking about this all the time. Elder Holland stated in the year 2000, 
I do wish to speak specifically to the deacons, teachers, and priests of the Aaronic Priesthood, and the young, newly ordained elders in the Melchizedek Priesthood, who today are the young and middle-aged. You of the rising generation, take note, what's he talking about? You who must be ready to use your priesthood, often at times in ways you did not anticipate. In that spirit, my call to you tonight is something of the call Joshua gave to an earlier generation of priesthood bearers who needed to perform a miracle in their time. To these who would need to complete ancient Israel's most formidable task, recapturing and repossessing their promised land of old. Joshua said, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I am certain the day will come when in an unexpected circumstance or a time of critical need, lightning will strike, so to speak, and the future will be in your hands. Be ready when that day comes. Be strong. Always be clean. Respect and revere the priesthood that you hold tonight and forever. Brethren, I testify that the call in every age, and especially your age, is Joshua's call. Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Close quote. Therefore, when I reflect on this question, what lessons are there in these chapters for me and the generation that I live in? I know that they relate directly to me. I know that the time will shortly come to pass when this rising generation, now living, will redeem and establish Zion and will dwell in the safe Savior's presence. I have faith, like the brother of Jared, in the fulfillment of this promise. Now, I need to strive to do everything I possibly can to be part of it. Awesome. Yeah, nice. This is something, obviously, we've talked about many a time and it's really good to have a nice refresher of it um i'll just mention a couple of things i don't think there's much that i really can on sh can or should add to this really but um i just want to say firstly isn't it crazy that israel didn't exist until 1948 firstly um it's almost as if it's <laughs> things are being fulfilled smooth like it's a prophecy or something right like it, it it's it's great like it's on it's we it's wild if you think about that right that's not that long ago uh the jews start heading back to palestine and somehow all these people get around put their heads together and go you know what they should have israel should be a thing again and then they get rightfully back to their home like that's wild honestly that don't happen often or ever so that's crazy um um yeah you're mentioning in here about what it was like for the the desolating sickness um dr Covenant 45 and what men were doing and it, it did make me think of um it was like a pretty good time to the readings this week because the jaredites basically we have hindsight because we have the scriptures to look back on the jaredites basically did were a good example of this right a good example of what people are doing now and did do during covid cursing God and dying, um, you know, had prophets, you know, Ether being one of the, I mean, let's say one of the greatest prophets of all time who had, had revelations almost unmatched. Um, and they shove him aside and cursed God and died and the spirit withdrew and they all got absolutely wrecked. And um, people have done that and are doing that now. And, we get to see what happened to the Jaredites. And I think we're yet to see, and these people are yet to see, unfortunately, the full extent of the repercussions of doing that, if that makes sense. So the repercussions will, you know, become more and more obvious as things move further and further towards the second coming and, and all the events, events leading up to it. Um, and then I was just thinking, imagine how much the Lord cannot wait to redeem his vineyard. You know, like it's it's his. I bought it with my like. You know, imagine how much he's what cannot wait. I, I bet he cannot wait, and I cannot wait. Um, and just a couple more things. I was thinking while I mean, I was going through this, like talking about the generation and us being the, you know, this being the time and us being the ones involved. And I was thinking, man, I feel like we've been raised specifically for this. Like, you know, often think about it, but like, if I think about it. 
I feel like we've been raised specifically for this. Like, I, I know that might sound weird to some people, but I don't know, man. I that just that's just how it feels, you know. Um, and then lastly, I think Elder Jeffrey R. Holland's advice is so good, and I think we should all take that advice. Be ready to use the priesthood in ways you don't anticipate. Lightning will strike at some point, and uh, when lightning strikes, it's quick, it's fast, it happens real quick, and uh, you have to be ready for it. You have to be clean. We have to sanctify ourselves. We have to already have sanctified ourselves um, and be ready so that when that lightning strikes, we are ready to act because what does he say? The future will be in your hands all of a sudden, right? Who knows what, what that means exactly, but it's really good advice. And I, I think I agree with Amon. Let's, let's take that advice. That's good advice. So, yeah. All right. So I have three, three, three things written down here. Um, you mentioned in the reading that the, that the times of the Gentiles is only mentioned one time in the New Testament, and then mentioned multiple times in um, Doctrine and Covenants. And I we I just on this paper um, entitled "You're Not Zion," and we we're talking about it in the thread. And I went in, and I did searches for the word Zion, and I did searches for the word New Jerusalem, and looked in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the Book of Mormon, and, and like how many times these words sh show up, and it's fascinating because it's like once again, it's like they don't sh they don't show up, like, and then all of a sudden in the Book of Mormon they're like fifty references, and it's like, well, why do you think that is? You think maybe that was one of the plain and precious truths that was just taken out, and it's like here's one of these ones where it's like the it, the Times Gentiles only mentioned one time in the New Testament, but yet. Here comes Joseph Smith, you know, just this crazy boy that all of a sudden hones in on this thing, and all of a sudden it's in all these modern revelations. Like, well, why? Like, why? Why would you pick that one thing to all of a sudden include in, in in like all these doctrine and covenants chapters? Like, it doesn't even make sense. And it's like it's one of those showcases where it's like, don't you realize how special it is to have the revelations we do expounding on that and why then do we ignore it? And maybe the reason why we ignore it are the same reason why the Jews and, and the early Christians and all the wicked people removed it from the scriptures for the exact same reason. We don't want to hear about it. We don't want to hear these things. And uh, and when we get a prophet of God like Joseph Smith that comes in, what's the very, very first thing he tries to do? Restore it. It's always like Moses. Restore it. Let's get our focus back on Zion and the new Jerusalem and the times of Gentiles and these times and so forth. So I think that's fascinating. So whenever I hear some like when like things like that where it's like this has only been mentioned once in the Old Testament, but it's like I mentioned a zillion times in the Doctrine and Covenants in the Book of Mormon. It's like your ears should perk up. You know, that's kind of like maybe it's important for us. So um so then the second thing here is Joshua's call. So that, once again, this was um reading this quote from Elder Holland here, and this thought came to me while you're reading it. So he says Joshua's call was to redeem his promised land. You will see lightning strike and you'll need to act. Your call today is Joshua's call. Like that's that, okay. That's, that's what, what that quote basically was. Okay. So here are my questions. One, if this isn't what Ammon just laid out, isn't what elder Holland was talking about. What was he talking about? Like, okay. So give, give me another thing that he was talking about because he, he th this is literally what he says Joshua's call was to redeem his promised land you will see lightning strike you will need to act and your call today is Joshua's call okay so what then what what then what what then once again you don't like what what Ammon said what's the alternative and then here's my second question if what Ammon just laid out wasn't what he was talking about what does that say about Elder Holland's intelligence and teaching skills? He like seriously, and so and what are you implying by saying that? Oh, that's not what he was talking about. What are you implying about Elder Holland's teaching skills? Because seems like if if that wasn't what he was applying, he's a terrible, terrible teacher. Because uh, that seems pretty straightforward to me. So somebody better give you know, hopefully can give me some other interpretation to that one because that seems to be what that. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Um, Topher also mentioned uh, the, the consequences or what, what we're going to see in this day. That's literally my first point. So my point, like, 
it goes right off the back of this point and answers exactly what Topher said. Topher said there at the very end, I have bought it with money. He was do- he was quoting Christ in the parable of the Noman, how much he wants to see it redeemed. And all of a sudden I had this question, does Christ care about money? Like, why does that bother him so much that he mentions it? I have bought it with money. Why even mention it? And I think that once again, I don't know how many times this has to be shown, it should showcase just how much the Lord values covenants even between men. A, because once again, what's money and I bought it? That's a covenant. You've made a covenant. I've given you something. You give me something. And B, how much he hates hypocrisy. He hates it. And your entire stupid Babylonian system is based off of money. I did it. I purchased it with the blood and, and coins of the early saints. And you didn't, you took it from me. I, I, so once again, it's like he hates it. He absolutely hates it so much that he, he says, I have bought it with money. I, I, I even did it according to your flawed ways of thinking. And I, and I, and you're still not giving it to me. And so, cause obviously the Lord doesn't care about money. You know, he doesn't, he, you know, it's not like the, uh, Joshua. It's not like Joshua's people went in and bought the promised land. So he doesn't care about money, but yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Like he's justified in his ownership of it, even from our point of view. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. (laughs) Any way you look at it. Yeah. That's good. All right. Nice. Well, uh, let's do mine. Uh, I took, I had a, like this week was interesting. I did a, I had a bunch of notes as I was studying it this week. And um, it was a funny one to try and whittle down to what ended up being what my insights are. And they're both kind of pretty simple principles, but um, I guess fascinating nonetheless. But uh, there were a lot of good things this week is what I'm trying to say. Um, anyway, so my 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 first insight here is from Ether 12, verse 27. And this is one of the famous scriptures that we're all very familiar with. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. You know, it's funny, by the way, when I read these scriptures and they're the really popular ones, I usually am straight away like, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> like it's, you know, the, the, people know this, I'm not talking about that. And then often what will happen is I'll read the uh, the the manual entry for it and then it'll be like oh man okay that's dang that's really good so i think that's what's happened here so the manual here is it's a pretty long part i've cut a lot of it out though too so but this was pretty good i think so it's todd weakness humility and grace it says weakness comes to men and women through the fall of adam the physical body and mind is susceptible to disease and decay we are subject to temptation and struggle Each of us experiences personal weaknesses. Nevertheless, the Lord clearly teaches that as we come unto him in humility and faith, he will help us turn weakness into strength. His grace is sufficient to make this transformation by lifting us above our own natural abilities. In a very personal way, we experience how the power of the atonement overcomes the effects of the fall. And here's probably why I liked it. It's because it's the next part comes from Elder Neil A. Maxwell. Um, and he spoke of how the Lord could help us overcome our weaknesses. When we read the script, read in the scriptures of man's weakness, this term includes the generic but necessary weakness inherent in the general human condition in which the flesh has such an incessant impact upon the spirit. Weakness likewise includes, however, our specific individual weaknesses, which we are expected to overcome. Life has a way of exposing these weaknesses. So I love that. That was really good. Furthermore, Elder Maxwell described how recognizing our weaknesses is one way that the Lord has chosen to increase our learning. When we are unduly impatient with an omniscient God's timing, we are really suggesting that we know what is best. Strange, isn't it? We who wear wrist watches seek to counsel him who oversees cosmic clocks and calendars. Because God wants us to come home after having become more like him and his son, part of this developmental process of necessity consists of showing unto us our weaknesses. 
Hence, if we have, so showing unto us our weaknesses, so keep that in mind. Hence, if we have ultimate hope, we will be submissive because his, with his help, those weaknesses can even become strengths. It is not an easy thing, however, to be shown one's weaknesses, as these are regularly demonstrated by life's circumstances. Nevertheless, this is part of coming unto Christ, and it is a vital, if painful, part of God's plan of happiness. That sentence there is what really, really stuck into my head. So I'll just read that again. If it, it is not an easy thing, however, to be shown one's weaknesses, as these are regularly demonstrated by life's circumstances. Nevertheless, this is part of coming unto Christ. And it is a vital, if painful, part of God's plan of happiness. Right? Keep that in mind. Uh, Moroni taught that not only must we exercise faith in the Lord, but we must humble ourselves as well. The book True to the Faith explains the meaning of true humility. To be humble is to recognize gratefully your dependence on the Lord, to understand that you have constant need for his support. Humility is an acknowledgement that your talents and abilities are gifts from God. It is not a sign of weakness. Timidity or fear. It is an indication that you know where your true strength lies. What is your true strength lie? Is it in yourself? Right. No. In the guide to the scriptures, we read that grace is the enabling, enabling power from God that allows men and women to obtain blessings in this life and to gain eternal life and exaltation after they have exercised faith, repented, and given their best effort to keep the commandments. Such divine help or strength is given through the mercy and love of God. And just lastly, President Thomas S. Monson gave the following words of comfort. Should there be anyone who feels he is too weak to change the onward and downward course of his life, or should there be those who fail to resolve to do better because of the that greatest of fears, the fear of failure, which we probably many of us suffer from, I'm sure I do, there is no more comforting assurance to be had than the Lord, the words of the Lord. My grace, said he, is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. All right, so so pretty good stuff in the manual there. So, but now here's my, you know, my my vomiting words here to uh, explain what I'm trying to get across here. So, people these days, people these days are defiant against humility. This is this is what I'm trying to get at. People these days are defiant against humility, rather than being willing to acknowledge their weaknesses or faults. They vaunt them instead and try to force everyone to accept them or praise them instead, right? And hang hang on with me. This makes sense in a minute. So don't judge me. You know, we, we talk about this a fair bit. Don't judge, right? We're not allowed to judge anyone for anything that they choose to want to do or be or say. Any ideology or sexuality is to be praised even when in clear opposition to God's commandments, right? Think think about this. And I don't want to don't want to harp on like one one certain group here but anyway um, it's going to happen automatically they're not willing to trust in the lord and turn their weaknesses into strengths but rather force everyone around them to accept their weaknesses as strengths think about that honestly lots of groups these days right they're not willing to acknowledge that what their their, their way of thinking is actually a weakness or a sin right let's even call it a sin instead they want to flip it and make everyone accept their sin or their weaknesses or whatever it is as strengths, right? It's, you know, normalize this, you know, this, you know, blah, blah, blah. Don't judge me. Don't, you know, it's, it's wild how they flipped it. And this is actually pride, right? So this is the opposite of humility. This is the opposite of acknowledging weakness. This is, the, you know, this is pride. Literally, it's the opposite. And it's the opposite of what the Lord requires. And funnily enough, pride is the chant for entire movements that follow this ideation, right? Isn't that kind of funny? You know, and they're sort of like, I mean, that you could say they're sort of saying, we are proud in our sin and our weakness. We don't need to change. Don't judge us. We love the way that we are. And you are the sinners for judging us and expecting us to want to be like you. So just think about that. I, th I think that's very fascinating. Um, and that, again, goes back to that one that I, that line that I repeated, coming under Christ is a vital, if painful, part of God's plan of happiness. You know what? It's painful to acknowledge that you're actually wrong and that you actually have weaknesses or sin that you you know you're living in sin or whatever. And um, what that says to me is that there's a lot of people these days who are not willing to acknowledge that they it's too painful and they would rather flip 
flip the switch, flip it around and, and put it back on everyone else and force everyone else to uh, accept it and praise them, I guess. So if only people could learn and understand that the Lord can use the weak and make them strong, if they but acknowledge their weaknesses and humble themselves before him. I personally persist in a constant acknowledgement of my weaknesses and inability and have hope and faith that the Lord can increase my capability. And he does, thankfully. But that's honestly, I, I live my day-to-day -day life as like relying on the Lord to, to you know, to make me better. Because again, um, where does your, as, as it said in the um, thing here in True to the Faith, where does your true strength lie? If anyone thinks their true strength lies in themselves, they're kidding themselves. True strength lies in, in God, right? And the only way you can really draw upon that true strength is by acknowledging your weaknesses and your, you know, your sins, I suppose. Um, and by doing that, he can turn what you are into, into strength. And he does. Um, and it made me think of this classic Neil A. Maxwell quote that we've, we've mentioned many times before. God does not begin by asking us our, about our ability, but only about our availability. And if we then prove our dependability, he will increase our capability. You know, it's our capability he increases. It's the strength, right? And I feel like you could fit humility in that in that sentence somewhere, right? Like, you know, if we were to show our humility, you know, he would increase our capability. It would it'd fit perfectly in there somewhere as well. Um, and then I was thinking, man, a little humility could have saved Coriantuma and all his people. Um, if if you know, if, you, if you've just done the readings this week, Coriantuma was um, just to touch on him for a second. Like, as I was reading that story, it was like. You know, it had a few moments where it really hit me. You know, one, he had he had the prophet, he had Ether come around and outline to him his sins, what he's done wrong, and what he what he could change, right? And to, and from the Lord, the Lord wants you to repent. And if you do, you and all your people can be saved. Right? Clear as day to him. Of course he doesn't. Things go horribly. And then we get to like watch in real time almost, you know, uh, as the story unfolds him coming to the realization of like his folly and how he, 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 he kind of realized he should have followed the prophet and he didn't. And we get to see his downfall, you know, in unfortunate terms, um, as it all comes to fruition, exactly as, as it was laid out for him. And it was, it's, I don't know, it was a really, um, it's a sad story, but it's a really good example of, and again, I, I I likened it to when Ammon did his insight as to people today, they they've done this, they are doing this, the same thing that Coriantuma has done, and it's too early for them to see the error of their ways. Kind of like it's like, at some stage, it'll become clear, and we will see in real time, um, them in their regret about having rejected the prophets, essentially, and um, it's not what you want to be doing. Um, whereas a little humility. You know, a little humility and acknowledging our weaknesses, although painful to do, um, can be turned into strengths. And to be honest, is the only way that we'll uh, be able to have happiness in this life and in the life to come, really. Um, yeah, that's, I'll leave it there. These days, I see too many people. This is a constant thing that I run into with members of the church. And every time I hear something like this, it makes me cringe. Um, I can't do that because I'm just not smart enough, strong enough, clever enough. Um, I can't do it like you. Yet you've, You're able to do these things. I can't do things like you can. Oh, that person can do that because they're good at X, Y, Z. I could never do that. I could never be like that. I could never be that person. I'm like this. I'm not like that. The way people talk about themselves and put themselves down and put themselves into little boxes and say, I'm incapable of anything outside of this box is so faith prohibiting. And so, and it flies so strongly in the face of what the Lord Jesus Christ wants to do for them and can, and can do for them and can help them become it's really, really frustrating. I just feel sad for them. Everybody has such potential in the Lord to become more than they are. And 
I, whenever people say that stuff to me, like, no, you can, I mean, you can do that. I can't do that. I say, I am you. You don't understand. I am you. I'm an idiot and I'm dumb and I've, I'm not, you know, by the world standards, really well educated or anything like that. But I can do these things because I've relied on the Lord and the Lord helps me do things and he will do that for you. And they, no, I mean, you can do these things. No. And I just, I'm just, I, I don't think that people, look at me and and get that there's been a journey in any anything that I do right I think people just look at me and go you are the way you are I am the way I am and there's there's a barrier that can never be met and I know that the same goes for Micah constantly people will say Micah you just have this memory you just have this memory where you can remember things I can't I can't do that little do people seem to realize even though Micah says it constantly it's from years and years and years and years of consistent work in studying and reading and going over the same quotes and going over the same subjects until it becomes part of him. And he has developed a great memory. It's He wasn't born with it. He developed it. It's a, it's a gift from the Lord. A- and so on and so forth. Micah has many gifts. Tova has many gifts. I believe I have many gifts. We weren't born with these things. Yes, we might have some natural talent in certain areas, but for the majority, I think I can speak for all of us. I'm sure you, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but the majority of what we have become, we've done through faith in Jesus Christ, putting in the work, relying on the Lord, seeing that he's helped us and blessed us and turned around and said, yes, that is that is a gift from God, you know, and acknowledging him. So I just, I think my message tonight would be, I hope that the people listening to this and when they read these scriptures and they understand faith as a brother of Jared and the importance of faith before the miracle, understand that the Lord wants you to become more than you are, wants me to become more than I am. Me right now, I am not what he wants me to be. I am a shadow of what he wants me to be. He can make something really special out of me, though. I know that because look what Jesus is and he wants us to be like Jesus. I have a big gap. But imagine what I could be on that journey to becoming like Jesus. I could I could become much more than I am now. And he wants that for you, but he can't do that for you if you don't believe he can do that for you. If you don't believe that he can make your weaknesses your strengths, he can fix the problems and make you better and you can become more like Jesus. But you have to have faith in that and you have to get to work. Yeah, I... the. You don't have the, I don't have the, I don't have Micah's memory, and then it's it's always like, oh man, Micah's reading all those scriptures again for like the hundredth time. We've already heard all this before, and it's like, well, that that's how you that's how you remember it. Like that's so yeah. You want to you want to remember? It's like anything, right? It's like, oh man. I will never be a good at soccer or football or video game. Pick something people love. And it's like, really? They're playing that map again? Really? They're do- It's like, because they enjoy doing it. They enjoy doing it. And if you do it enough times, you're going to get just as good at everything else. You're going to memorize it just as just as much. So, yeah. The whole, uh, if Ammon was there or if Micah was there, they could have said it better. I, You know... I would, I would, that one always bothers me on multiple levels because it's like, because, but Micah wasn't put there, but Ammon wasn't put there. You were put there. Like, God didn't put me there. He put you there, which means that no, I couldn't have done it better because God wouldn't have stuck, would have stuck me there if I could have done it better. He put you there because you could have done it better. And if you follow the Spirit, there's absolutely nothing that you would say or do that I wouldn't have said or done. It would have been the same, right? You need to have that. You need to have that faith in the um, the Holy Ghost, man. So uh, the line that I really want to like, it just when when you read it again, it's like, do we like? Sometimes I I hear these things and it's like, I love the student manuals and I love Elder Maxwell. I love these old quotes because it just reminds me like this exists somewhere out there. You know, it's like, it's out there, but we just never hear it. And it's, we are expected to overcome our weaknesses. Such a simple line. And it's like, when is the last time you've heard that in church? I mean, honestly, when is the last time, Micah, you have ever heard that line taught? 
And it's like, man, I can I can't even remember. I can't even remember. And it's like such a simple, beautiful line that's like, really? Do you, do we even believe that anymore? Do we believe we're expected to overcome our weaknesses? And then people will immediately tack on like, well, sometime in the next life. And it's like, that wasn't said there. Read the quote. That wasn't said there, right? These are they who overcome all, right? These are they who overcome all. And I think it's 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 fascinating. It's like we're expected to overcome our weaknesses and we're expected to never rebel. So I mean it's like like there's never supposed to be rebellion and our weaknesses we're supposed to overcome over time. And um and I think that uh you know it's those things I need to hear every once in a while just to remind myself because I think that um I mean, just the by the act of diffusion, uh, you know, osmosis, just being around people, you, you, and you, if you don't read these things often enough, you start to just kind of believe, like, eh, I'm not expected to overcome all my weaknesses. Um, you know, I can stay, I can stay a little bit of, you know, I can, that mixture, you know, that you start to self justify. And uh, you hear people like Max when you just say it just so bluntly. And then, like, he doesn't even like build up to it. Like it's a hard thing to say. It's like, yeah, well, we're expected to overcome our weaknesses. And then he just keeps going and you're like, I, you know, those are the kind of men and women that I want to surround myself with. And uh, so I need to, I need to do it. And so, and that's why I love Zion or Bust so much. And it's also why people leave Zion or Bust. So it's the number one reason because uh, Zion or Bust members are good at reminding each other that we all have weaknesses and that we need to overcome them. And uh, I think you went over that really well about how it's not fun <laughs> to, have to be, re to be reminded that you got weaknesses. And uh, one of those, one of those that, uh, w that was mentioned last week is, is the Uber affluent, you know, and I'll tell you what, they don't last long. Like the ones that want to live Uber affluent, they either are just kind of lurkers or they're gone. Uh, they they don't they do not last long in Zyner Bus because I'll tell you what people want it, it doesn't feel good and people want to enjoy living in their weaknesses so it's it's not just getting it called out they love their weaknesses right whatever they call them our favorite sins our summer cottages in Babylon it's, it isn't just we like we don't like them being called out man we just love rolling in them we just <laughs> we just like like a pig in the mire man we just love it and so. Great insight. Although it's hard hard not to like Maxwell for me. So somebody does, oh, and Maxwell, and ooh, Elder Bruce on McConkie, and oh, and it's like, I don't know why, but I like this insight. <laughs> uh, yeah, just can't put my <laughs> finger on it. Yeah, I thought. <laughs> uh... so, all right. So this insight of mine goes right off of uh, Ammon's insight. And it answers the question Topher is. In fact, uh, Ammon and I use the exact same student manual here. I use both of them. Ammon only included the second half. So in the student manual here, I'll read the first half. Uh, it's There's from two different student manuals. And so it's interesting because they both say introduction. So it's like from two different LDS student manuals just from different years. And uh, this one says, The cycles of wickedness and calamity observed among the Nephites had also occurred among the Jaredites. It is difficult to imagine a more thorough warning to Latter-day people. Wait, what? <laughs> huh? That, that's a, wait, I thought that was just back then. Warning to us, why? Why? This people can't fall. And then Ammon read the exact same thing, right? The, 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 this, the, that student manual. Ask yourself the question, what lessons are there in these chapters for me and the generation I lived in? So then he read that, and then he talked about the, the generation was the time the Gentiles was fulfilled. Well, I'm going to actually answer what Topher went in. So what are some of these nasties that we're going to see? So on the church's website, under the abominations of desolation, we read, Conditions of desolation born of abomination and wickedness. Pay close attention to what the abominations and wickedness were, as we continue, were to occur twice in fulfillment to Daniel's words. The first was to be when the Roman legion under Titus in AD 70 laid siege to, to Jerusalem. The 4th century church fathers, uh, Eus, what would you say that, Eusebius of Caesarea and 
Epiphanius of Salamis. That's a good sandwich. Cite a tradition that before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, the early Christians had been warned to flee to Pella in the region of the Decapolis across the Jordan River. Um, spe and uh, by the way, I took that part from actually uh, a Wikipedia, I believe. Speaking of the last days, of the days following the restoration of the gospel and its declaration for a witness unto all nations, our Lord said, and again shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. So what was the first desolation again? Well, we find that in Luke chapter 21. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, that's that Titus we just read about above, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh, then let them who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them who are in the midst of it depart out and let not them who are in the countries return to enter into the city for these be the days of vengeance that all things that are written may be fulfilled. Exactly what we just read above. But what about the abominations and wickedness? So what was the, what was the big problems here? In the student manual for Jeremiah, uh, the, the, the subheading reads, the temple would not save Judah. The boldness of Jeremiah's statement can be realized only when one recalls the importance given to the temple by the reforms of Josiah in 621 BC. So the temple was always important, but let's say there was a, let's say a new prophet that shows up, makes some re reformations, makes some changes and changes the focus heavily to that of a temple and temple worship. So once again, compare that to, to latter day should be easy. Josiah had made it the sole place of sacrificial worship of Jehovah for all Jews. So it's now the center location for worship in an attempt to stamp out idol worship. So you could say it was even done for a good reason. The temple and its priests thus had acquired by this time greater importance than ever before. So ever before in the history of this dispensation, temples and its priests are great, have a greater importance than ever before. Then, in the name of Jehovah, Jeremiah shows up onto the scene, issues a challenge that struck at the very existence of the temple. He plainly told the Jews that if they would mend their ways and become righteous, they would be spared. Otherwise, not even the temple would save them because they had made the temple a den of robbers. Because of the great reverence the people had for the temple, though it was a false reverence, it is not surprising that Jeremiah was quickly arrested and imprisoned. The language of Jeremiah combined with that of Isaiah was used by Jesus when he cleansed the temple. So what about the second desolation? Well, Doctrine Covenants chapter 45, and in that generation shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, which is exactly what Ammon went in. There shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass until they shall see an overflowing scourge for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. That's your army of Titus moment. Doctrine and Covenants 112. Verily, verily, I say unto you, darkness covers the earth and gross darkness, the minds of the people and all flesh has become corrupt before my face. Behold, vengeance comes speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation. Once again, the language choice here, right back to Jeremiah, which once again, what were those? The Book of Lamentations, right? Also, um, same time period, same prophet. And as a whirlwind, it shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord. Okay, And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. There's your abomination of desolation twice. And why? What's going on? What's the problem? First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name and have not known me and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. Therefore, see to it that you trouble not yourselves concerning the affairs of my church. First Thessalonians chapter five. For yourselves know perfectly that the, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But ye brethren are not in darkness that that, that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, 
Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Paul's there judging other people as sleepers. Sorry, that's not very nice. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. End quote. As soon as we start say saying things like, we have four years left to prepare, like, you know, you know, we got a good president now. Woo, things are looking up. That's when biblical Latter-day Saints, those who really grounded in the pyramid of truth, really buckle down and get worried. Because it could come suddenly. It will come suddenly. Literally any minute. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Joseph Smith, when talking about this same thing, which would be crying peace, he taught, we ought to have the building up of Zion as our greatest object. When wars come, which they will, we shall have to flee to Zion. The cry isn't to make, isn't to make peace. The cry is to make haste. The last revelation says, you shall not have time to have gone over the earth until these things come. The time is soon coming when no man will have any peace but in Zion and her stakes. Oh, but this, this, Micah, this only has to do with spiritual things. Like, people are just treating each other poorly or, you know, you know, bullying people online. Oh, okay, well, Joseph Smith continues. I saw men hunting the lives of their own sons and brother murdering brother. Women killing their own daughters and daughters seeking the lives of their mothers. Mm, I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I saw armies arrayed against armies. I saw blood desolations fires. The son of man has said that the mother shall be against the daughter and the daughter against the mother. These things are at our doors. They will follow the saints of God from city to city. Satan will rage and the spirit of the devil is now enraged. I know not how soon these things will take place, but with a view of them, shall I cry peace? Or should we cry in peace? No, I will lift up my voice and testify of them. How long will you have good crops and the famine be kept off? I do not know. And then he says this, when the fig tree leaves, know then that summer is nigh at hand. And if you know about the, once again, the fig tree leaf in that parable, it deals with the generation in which the times of Gentiles is fulfilled. So once again, when you see this generation born, this fig leaf start to, to come forth, then you'll know that summer is nigh at hand, which is exactly what Ammon went over. So what should terrify people to the point of not being able to sleep at night is that there is literally nothing. There's nothing left on the biblical prof prophetic table needed to be checked off before sudden destruction, before damage to the olive trees, etc. There's nothing left. That's what we're waiting for. There's not a single thing. The generation, it's already here. Ammon just went over that. The desolating sickness already came. Prophet of God referenced it. The rise in priestcraft, secret combinations, idolatry, check. Women ruling over men and women ruling over them, as it says in Isaiah, check. Standing in holy places versus raising your voices, cursing God and dying spiritually. And went over that one as well. Check. Slaves boiling and rising against masters who are marshaled and ready for war. I think we saw a little bit more of that again in this last election. Check. And have taking place right now. The remnant finding each other, rising in power, glory, and might. I would say that that was a check with the Zioner bus. People got upset about that. But then President Nelson came out once again and said, this is actually taking place right now in the world. So once again, check was right on that one. The barges being made and prepared, oil filled, check. That is taking place. People crying peace, a temple, a temple, a temple, etc. Is that taking place? You better believe it. So what's left? There's only one thing left. The sudden destruction, the damage to the olive trees, the return of the servant, the famine as the famine, as Joseph Smith said here, war, the second abomination of desolation, etc. That's it. And all these things were not around in 2019. That's what people need to understand. Is that in 2019, I was saying these are the next things slated on the list. People need to realize that a lot of those got checked off really fast in just the last four years. People are now crying peace when they should be crying haste. People are crying a temple, a temple, a temple when they should be crying. You've made his house a den of robbers. We can concern not ourselves with the affairs of, of Christ's church, as he said we should do in Doctrine and Covenants. And we uh, should also not steady the ark, etc. But we can also be watchmen.
while also being children of the light, as Paul said. We can heed the warning in the scriptures written specifically for us and the generation in which we live in, and we can be sober. We know not how soon these things will take place. Okay. We know a when the general timeline, but with a view of them, shall we cry peace? No, we must lift up our voices and testify of them and give meat in due season or with the hypocrite, we shall lift up our eyes in hell being a thirst. Nice. I don't know about you guys, but I could really go a nice big Epiphanius Salamis sandwich right about now. <laughs> In Caesarea. Or, uh, yeah, a, or a Caesarea, a Caesarea salad. salad. Did, did that not sound like a Caesar salad with a salami <laughs> freaking sandwich? Yeah. You know, man, that was. Or, or, or a uh, or later in later in there was um, a nice plate of lamentations, lamingtons. You guys don't have lamingtons, I don't think in America, but. Lamington. I always think when I hear lam yeah. lamentations, I always think lamingtons. Love some um, chocolate and coconut lamentations. <laughs> uh, the salamis sandwich, though, that was that was hilarious. Uh, I, again, I don't, I don't want to add too much to this. I think, I don't know, this is too good. I can't really benefit much here. I don't think, but I just, I did note a couple of things down. Uh, not even a temple can save us. I mean, it's a fantastic point and something that we definitely, as a people, uh, and, and let's be clear, the temple's great. We need to go there. There's things we need to do there. But the temple will not save us from things that will, are going to come, right? Um, and uh, where, where, where did it say, um, I say? I note things down and I forget where the reference came from in the thing. I wrote down Den of Robbers. And I forget what the what the reference is there too. That but, was the Jeremiah student manual, right? Yeah, because they had made the temple a den of robbers. Yeah, and um, the reason I noted that noted that down is a certain chief, right? I won't even say who exactly, but people might know who that is just from that reference. Um, come out recently and bragged about having a temple recommend uh, renewed as recently as a month ago, and yet is railing and raging against the church and um, suing the church. And um, claiming to be essentially a prophet, like uh, essentially a prophet, um, and dragging a huge amount of people uh, away with him, uh, and yet bragged about having a temple recommend um, himself when clearly he does not believe in the church. So he had to either lie in the temple rec recommend interview, or um, I mean, he had to lie in it. I don't know how else you can get away with it because he certainly does not believe the church as it stands now is the Lord's church. He thinks that he's, he's the man, right? So, um, I, I mean, let's not say that the temple is a den of, a den of robbers all the time, but it's certainly, there are people in our church who can turn it into a den of robbers. Certainly. Um, they are a, a, amongst us in the church. Um, and, and, Obviously, because of that it's pretty clear there are many blaspheming in the midst of the Lord's house, right? I think we, I think that's pretty clear. Um, Joseph Smith, I, I love, um, and I love like Micah's, um, you know, ending little uh, paragraph that really tied it all together. But Joseph Smith said, uh, you know, shall I cry peace? No, I'm not going to cry peace. Instead, I cry haste, right? Um, and it's the same for us. Shall we cry cry peace? No, it's because um, the second that we cry peace is, and again, try and find the reference, but the second we cry peace is when sudden destruction cometh upon them, right? So people don't need to be told everything's great. All is well in, all is well in Zion, right? The temple is the save us. We're all good. Um, the church is just true and great and... Um, Everything will be sweet. No, uh, people need to understand and be made aware of the things that are to come, the destruction that is to come, the the potential den of robbers that does and will exist, um, the fact that sudden destruction will sudden right sudden destruction will come when people think there is peace and safety. People need to be made aware of this, not lulled into a false sense of all is well in in Zion. Um, so shall shall we cry peace? No. We should be making people aware the temples can't save us. And uh, and again, and, and the last thing that I want to just say is when Micah said, 
these things went around in 2019. That's crazy. I mean, you know, it's like five, not even five years, right? Um, how fast things can change? Lightning, lightning, right? Um, yeah, I mean, and that that's that's all I'll say. Really cool, really good. It's already clear enough. What would have happened to the Saints after the martyrdom of Joseph Smith if they had just retreated to the temple? And the answer to that is that they would have burned in the temple. They they destroyed Nauvoo Temple and the Saints in an instant, like lightning struck, had to follow the prophet and do something really, really difficult, which was leave everything behind and go to a place that was outside of their own country. It was it was a different country at the time. It was uncivilized. It was unsettled. It was literally a step into the complete darkness with nothing. And many knew that they were risking their families' lives, and many lost members of their families on that journey, and yet they made that journey. That is, to me, that is the example. If people had tried to hunker down and stay, no, no, we're staying here. We're just going to make it work. We're going to make it happen. Those people either died or their religion left them. Their religion left them. The prophet left them behind. Their, their disobedience in following the counsel of the prophet extracted them from the Lord's church, extracted them from the Lord's blessings. Those that had, if anyone had decided, we're just going to retreat to the temple and hang around the temple and be in the temple, they would have burned with it. Um, and, and, and again, we have to keep reminding those listening. We love the temple. We revere the house of the Lord. We respect it. We're grateful for the covenants that we can take out there. But when we begin to worship the temple and use the temple as a scapegoat for making the decision to do what the Lord needs us to do, which is to follow the prophet in all things and not to neglect every other needful thing in the kingdom um you know if we've got people that are saying well i just go to the temple i go every day i go 17 times a day 18 times a week but you know you know that they're neglecting every other aspect of gospel living and they're using the temple as their hiding place from doing those things you know if you know that they have a temp terrible family life and they're not spending any time with their family or helping their family or anything like that but they just retreat to the temple um, it would be like those that that were trying to maybe retreat to the temple in Nauvoo or Kirtland or stay behind in Egypt when the Hebrews left, their religion leaves them. The temples aren't going to save them. It's the exact same thing in Jeremiah's time. They were never more pious in their temple worship. And yet at no point in history was temple worship of less value than right in that moment when they were disrespecting the, the, the use and the attendance of the temple because they're doing in hypocrisy. They weren't, they were inwardly, they weren't pure people, but they were trying to show that they were pure by doing the the rites and the or you know the symbolic gestures of spirituality. But internally, they weren't spiritual. And so today, as well, we're seeing temple people retreating in the temples and using the temple as the scapegoat. We're seeing it time and time and time again. So this is a really, really, really great reminder. Um, and 100%, man, in 2019, none of these things that happened. You just rattled off a massive list and added to my insight perfectly. And all of those things have just happened in the past couple of years. They've just happened. And there's nothing else that needs to happen. There is nothing else that needs to happen. All it is is bang, sudden destruction. Bang, sudden calamity. And Elder Holland taught lightning is going to strike, guys. Like, how much time do you have to prepare for a lightning strike? You don't. You're either ready for a lightning strike or you're struck by it and you're dead. There's going to come a time when there is no more time and we're right there because of every reason we've just gone through. But lightning is going to strike and those that have gained power in the priesthood, the young and the middle-aged, the strength of the Lord's house, those that have prepared themselves are going to be the ones that are ready to go and do the work. And everybody else who, who, who isn't quite there or didn't try or retreated to the temple without inwardly trying to become anything or receive any power or do anything that become like the Lord or do anything. They're not going to be ready for the lightning strike.
You know, I also, you know, want to issue a formal complaint. I feel like Jeremiah, Jesus, the student manuals, I think they fixate way too much on priestcraft. You know, I'm getting a little tired of them just, I mean, it's like in every reading that they're, they're like, priestcraft this and pre like, so I don't know. I think that they, maybe they just need to move on, you know? <laughs> Totally agree. Nice. I didn't put it in Jeremiah, folks. I didn't put it. I didn't make Jesus say it, and I didn't put it in the student manual. Uh. <laughs> yep. L lodge those complaints higher up the chain. <laughs> <laughs> we can only work with what we're seeing here. Come on. All right, uh, dude. This week, honestly, just real quick, this week. I was thinking to myself, am I reading the same book as everybody else? Because I don't see people talking about this stuff, but it's in the student manuals and the Come Follow Me manual and the scriptures. It's all there, but no one's talking about any of this stuff. So I don't even know if we're reading the same book. Anyway, carry on. People have the old uh, blinders on, you know, just want to focus on what they want to focus on. Anywho, okay. Um, this is my last insight here. And again, this is another one. This is pretty short and sweet, this one. And again, it's not something that I expected to cover. But when I read the manual again for this one, I was like, this is a good learning for me. And I expect it might be a good learning for everyone. So Ether 12, verses 33 and 34. And again, I remember that thou hast said, that thou hast loved the world, even unto the laying down of thy life for the world, that thou mightest take it again to prepare a place for the children of men. And now I know that this love which thou hast had for the children of men is charity. Wherefore, except men shall have charity, they cannot inherit that place which thou hast prepared in the mansions of thy father. So charity, right? again, did not expect to cut, do another ins like insight about charity. We've talked about charity a lot. But listen to this. And think about whether you truly have or even fully understand charity. Because this is what blew my mind a little bit. So this is from the manual. It's called This Love is Charity. The Savior showed the most perfect charity or sacrificial love when he gave his life and atoned for each of us. We must pray that we may be filled with this love so we can inherit eternal life. Elder Marvin J. Ashton of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained what it means to have charity. Charity is perhaps in many ways a misunderstood word. Hmm. We often equate charity with visiting the sick, taking in casseroles to those in need, or sharing out excess with those who are less fortunate. Right, and that is, sure, that's charity. But really, true charity is much, much more. Real charity is not something you give away. It is something that you acquire and make, make a part of yourself. And when the virtue of charity becomes implanted in your heart, you are never the same again. It makes the thought of putting others down repulsive. Now, I'm highlighting all these things because I'm like, far out. Do I actually have charity? Do I really? Because I thought I did. <laughs> I thought I do. Um, perhaps the greatest charity comes when we are kind to each other, when we don't judge or categorize someone else. Again, there's a judging there is a, a time when we can we can judge right but in terms of like charitably like judging like someone who's poor or whatever uh of course not um when we simply give each other the benefit of the doubt or remain quiet charity is accepting someone's differences weaknesses and shortcomings having patience with someone who has let us down or resisting the impulse to become offended again remember the lord did all these things right it was a perfect example of all these things. When someone doesn't handle something in a way, sorry, so it's resisting the impulse to become offended when someone doesn't handle the way, handle something the way we might have hoped. Did that happen to the Savior? A whole bunch of times. Charity is refusing to take advantage of another's weaknesses and being willing to forgive someone who has hurt us. Charity is expecting the best of each other. So I don't know about you guys straight away, but that was a different kind of take on charity that I'd never really... I guess it's obvious, but it's it's also a, a different take that I've never really heard. And so it really made me think, and it's kind of like, do I really have charity? Do I really understood, understand what charity is? So anyway, I'm 
probably going to say this exact same thing in my, my words here. So this is my last little thoughts here on this. I thought I understood charity. And I feel like deep down, I am a good person. Right? <laughs> like maybe everyone think, obviously everyone, everyone probably thinks they're a good person. Um, and I hope I am. I feel, I feel like I am. Uh, and charity is the pure love of Christ, right? It's being willing to sacrifice yourself for the benefit of others, literally to be Christ-like. And I give money to homeless people. Right, and when we and we will take casseroles to people who need them, but guess what? That only scratches the surface. It isn't something we do; it's something we become to the point that you are never the same again. And then I'm like, have I been changed to the point that I'm never been the same again? I think I've come a long way, um, and I'm hoping that it isn't that black and white. I feel like I'm halfway there. So much of this quote resonates with me, and yet so much of it I need to work on. Can you accept people's differences and weaknesses and shortcomings? Like, I, yeah, I can struggle with that. Can you be patient with someone who has let you down? I can struggle with that. Can you resist being offended? I think everyone can struggle with that. Can you forgive someone when who, someone? Can you forgive when someone does some does offend or hurt you? That's that's hard. Do you expect the best of others and then roll gracefully with the results when your expectations are dashed? Almost certainly. Rough. After reading this, you might feel like me and realize you've got a long way to go, but I'm trying. And that persistence to improve and become Christ-like, I think, is the main thing. And that's my insight. But I feel like, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I hope I'm not the only one here. <laughs> I feel like I've got a, a long way to go to really um, grasp and understand and, and become charitable. Since I'm since I'm talking right after this, maybe I'll go first. So that you don't have to listen to me back to back, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know I think with all of these things, definitions are so important, and I think that once again going to which Topher went into really well here in these good really good questions. I think that comparing everything back to the Savior is is what you have to do. You have to do right, like you have to. So when he says here, for example, he says. Um, like do we accept other people's weaknesses and it's like okay but then he counters that with expect the best in people and it's like well that i think that how people would interpret the word accept and accept people's weaknesses they then wouldn't know how they would connect that to expect the best in somebody like how do you quote unquote, accept their weaknesses while also expecting the best in them. And I think once again, it, you just have to go to the savior when it's like, when, if you think accepting weaknesses is just being okay with people's weaknesses ad nauseum, like never mentioning them, never trying to help them improve, then it's like, well, then the savior sinned because the savior did that all the time, right? If you think, um, once again, this, you will never put people down. This one was interesting because it was uh, in brackets. So I wonder what he actually said there. So the student manual there actually edited that. So I'd be curious what he actually said there. But uh, once again, same kind of concept of whatever he said there, putting people down becomes repulsive. And I think, okay, like what would people think is putting people down? Would people think calling people liars, cheats, uh, a den of thieves, a den of robbers, vipers hypocrites would people view any of that as putting people down i think a lot of people would view that as putting people down but one, once again the savior did that a plenty and so it's like uh i think with all of these things it becomes really really important to to when we're creating our definitions and understanding just go to this the life of the savior just go to the life of the savior and, and you know one of those things that you're never going to find in the life of the savior ever is you're never going to find him preaching for money. You're never going to find that. You're never going to find examples of him living in affluence or wealth. In fact, it says that the Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. You know, so we don't even know if this guy had a home. And uh, he also, you know, found sleeping on a boat comfortable. So, I mean, I mean he, he, so once again, we never found any of that in his character so once again like when we're creating these definitions and justifying stuff go to the life of the savior you're not going to be able to justify affluence like you do and you're not going to be able to find a way to, to justify priestcraft like you do and 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 uh, a lot of these other things like 
we we think we're doing we, we actually find in the life of the savior and he was our perfect example and so uh, i think that's i think that's really important and do we have a do we have a long ways to go yeah 100% and i think i i heartily amen the it, it's the um the journey right and once again somebody just posted in in discord something about becoming perfect and how like once again there's this this contrast between like well, we shouldn't strive for perfection. We should strive for like, well, what did he say? It was like, we shouldn't strive for perfection. We should strive for uh, like, what was it? Something like love or we should strive for these things. And it was like, well, actually we should strive for perfection. It's just the mode of transportation. So stop focusing on being perfect. Focus on being clean and worthy. And um, it's like, you know, it's actually stop focusing on being institutionally perfect and focus on being perfected in Christ. So once again, it's that how we're how we're going about these things. So and when you're talking about these things, you're talking about being perfected in Christ. So you're doing it to yourself. So you're showing charity to yourself, Topher, by saying, I should expect the best of myself. And can I be forgiving with myself when I da what do you say? Dash? dash my hopes to pieces immediately <laughs> so, <laughs> so when i expect the best out of myself and then immediately dash myself to pieces uh how how well do i do it continuing on and just working on those things and being perfect perfected in christ so very good love it nice just before Emmon goes i just uh with everything that you said you just made me realize i did not realize until just now when you were talking this actually relates really well to my first insight and it, talking about weaknesses, right? Yeah. And the last line in that quote, charity is expecting the best of each other. And how, do, how does that work? Well, it's like charity is expecting the best of each other. If we're talking about weaknesses, we just had um, Elder Neil A. Maxwell say that we're expected to overcome our weaknesses. There you go. Right? So Yeah. And so I didn't even catch that until you kind of mentioned it there. So it's really good. So charity is expecting the best of each other and expecting people to be overcome their weaknesses like yeah like, we're not meant to just accept like people just aren't just great the way they are charity's like yeah of course we expect the best of each other because people should be expected to overcome their weaknesses yeah anyway that was a cool little right. tie and i did not see yeah and therefore charity is the mind and will of god so we've had lots of really good discussion and discord about charity and what charity actually is and it is one of those eye-opening experiences where you change your 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 defining understanding of the word charity in a gospel sense the lord's sense from i give money to strangers to um what the lord is actually trying to teach us about what we need to become and gain charity and so he just really quickly we've had lots of discussions in the past on what it means to gain a fullness of the holy ghost a fullness of the spirit or a fullness of the holy ghost and which is essentially to have your calling and election made sure you receive the fullness of the Holy Ghost. It means you've gone through all the ordinances. All of them have been confirmed by the Holy Spirit of promise. They've tick ticked all the boxes. You've done everything that the Lord has asked you to do. And then you get to the point where the Lord can say, you've, you've done everything I've asked you to do. Now your calling and election is made sure, right? So fullness of the Holy Ghost equals having your calling and election made sure. And the a fullness of the of the spirit or fullness of the Holy Ghost also equals the mind of God. Once you get to that point, you you share the will and the mind of God. Joseph Smith taught until we have perfect love, think charity, until we have perfect love, we are liable to fall. And when we have a testimony that our names are sealed in the Lamb's book of life, we have perfect love, and then it is impossible for false Christ to deceive us. So what he's teaching there is, once we have charity, as the Lord defines it, perfect love, then our names are in the Lamb's Book of Life and we can't be removed from it. So your calling election has been made sure because you've gained the mind and the will of the Lord or perfect love. You've gained charity. So if you want a fullness of, of, of charity, if you want the mind, if you want the pure love of Christ, you have to get yourself to the point where, like you were saying, you it's 
it's a it's what you become it's what you are becoming it's not what you give it's what you become you're becoming one with Jesus Christ to the point where he says to you a good and faithful servant you will come and join me in, in you know in the kingdom of my father and your mind and your will is therefore the same as him you therefore obtain the perfect perfect love that he has which is charity which means you can't fall. Once you've got that perfect love, that perfect charity, there's nothing you can do aside from murder and cold blood. Apart from that, nothing you can do. You've got that perfect love, nothing you can do. So it's not a feeling. Charity is not a feeling. It's not a way of thinking. It's the mind of God. It is a perfection of the attributes discussed in lectures on faith and a perfection that takes place in the mind. Yeah, and we read about those beautiful calling and election made sure in the Book of Mormon this year, right? Where the Lord said, I will give you this power because I know you won't say or ask for something that doesn't align with my will. So once again, if if charity is the pure love of Christ and we've reached a point in time where we won't do or say anything that isn't in line with Christ, well, then we've reached perfect charity, right? We've, we, we've obtained it, so. Great. Oh, love it. But you know what? I love the Book of Mormon. So the Book of Mormon is awesome. Okay. So. Book of Mormon you, and Joseph Smith. It's so clear. You were born that way. You were born with the that desire. You were born with that talent. It's not something that I can get, Mike. Mike, it's not something that I am born with. I think everyone's. Born, I think everyone's born with a distaste for reading Paul. I think that's something we can all agree on. It's just that's an acquired oh. taste. We have to acquire that taste. That's a. Cheers to that. That's an acquired taste. That's a pinky up taste. That once you've once you've dined on the fine dining for long enough, you're like, mm, Paul, my man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last he's one. Good, but he's not easy. No, he's not. No, he is not. He is whole quail. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, all right. So this is the last one. This one's really small, but I couldn't this one I just couldn't help but feel bad for Coriantumer and and relate it to a lot of people that I know in the world. In the student manual here, it just says Coriantumer. Coriantumer had devoted a great deal of time, you can say energy, his heart, his soul, to studying all the arts of war and all the cunning of the world. Yet he rejected the simple message of ether, which would have brought him peace in a way that all his military skill could not do. Note the prophet's ethers promised to Coriantumr in verses 20 and 21, as well as its fulfillment. And then I say this, I see and continue to see those who over glorify or over glory in the art of war, the veteran and the war experience. These people suffer from PTSD, they, bec they may be hyper-focused on war because they reject the simple message or messages of the prophets, which would bring peace in a way that all their military skills and experiences could never do. They reject those with the spirit of Zion and forge their own path, and then complain about the darkness of the path, as well as the company they have to keep on that path. You are with who you are traveling down that busy yet lonely road because of your own choices, Coriantumr. It isn't a virtue to then bemoan the company or the journey. You could have kept your company with those who possess the true spirit of Zion and who loved you, but you would not. Remember, ye who call yourselves the people of God, there shall only be three groups. And we read about him in 35 chapter 7. Now this secret combination, which had brought, once again, secret combination and priestcraft joined at the hip, which had brought so great iniquity upon the people, did gather themselves together and did place at their head a man who they did call Jacob. And I love how they did call him Jacob. I wonder what his real name was. And they did call him their king. Therefore, he became a king over this wicked band. And he was one of the chiefest who had given his voice against the prophets who testified of Jesus. 
Well, he was one of the chiefs who raised the voice. Curse God, if you will. Came to pass that they were not so strong in numbers as a tribe of the people who were united together, save it were their leaders that established their laws, everyone according to his tribe. Nevertheless, they were enemies. Notwithstanding, they were also not a righteous people. Yet they were united in the hatred of those who had entered into a covenant to destroy the government. So there's two groups right there. Let's read about a third group in Doctrine and Covenants chapter 45. And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints, the Most High God. And the glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord also shall be there, insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it, and it shall be called Zion. And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take up his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. And it shall be said among the wicked, Let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. And it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations, and shall come to Zion, singing with songs of everlasting joy. End quote from the scriptures. There's going to be three groups. Three groups only. One, those united to destroy the laws of the land. For us, that would be our let's say our constitution. Two, those united in a hatred of the first group and a love for war, and you could say a glorification of the veteran. And group number three, the righteous remnant, the few who prepare themselves spiritually and flee to Zion. Choose carefully. Second Nephi chapter 13 or Isaiah chapter 3, we read. And it shall come to pass, instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink, and instead of a girdle, a rent, and instead of well-set hair, baldness, and instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth, burning, instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war, and her gates shall lament and mourn, and she shall be desolate, and shall sit upon the ground. And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread, and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Nice. You know, I don't even have much to add to this, except uh, uh, all I can say is we can see those groups, those three groups that you're talking about, we can see those forming now already. You know, one group to destroy the, the laws of the land and the constitution. I'll tell you who I think that is, but I won't tell you. <laughs> um, those united in the hatred of the first group and a love of, uh, and a love for war. I don't know how well formed that group is right now, but it is. I think, I mean, it it, it kind of always exists, right? But um, it's certainly there, and it's certainly growing. And then the righteous remnant that's that's certainly growing, and um, and hopefully will continue. Well, it will it will continue to grow. Um, and so I think it's important that we know and understand about that and choose now which group, I mean, hopefully if you can understand the difference and that there are these different groups, hopefully you don't care about groups one and two at all. Do you know what I mean? Like just <laughs> like, you know, I mean, the, the group you want to be in is the righteous remnant. Let's worry about that. Let's focus on that. Um, and again, with Coriantuma, uh, and, and I said it before, we had the hindsight where we got to see his downfall in real time and he ended up with, I mean, it's insane what he went through, honestly, and the massive regret that he had. Um, and, uh, you know, let, let's say he was in one of those first two groups, probably, probably the second one, and um, nothing good, nothing good can come of being in either of those first two groups and we have the Book of Mormon to show us that fact. And um, only good can come from those who will flee to Zion. Everyone else is going to end up, essentially, end up maybe not as bad as Coriantuma. He had it pretty rough, but again, because of his own, his own choices. Um, but it essentially comes down to Coriantuma didn't follow the prophet. Follow the prophet or don't. You know, be, be righteous or don't. Get caught up in these other nonsense groups and, and worrying about things that, aren't important spiritually, uh, eternally, or, yeah. 
yeah, or be be, be the, the the righteous remnant. That's pretty much as simple as it is. Anyway, good stuff. That second group think that they're righteous. It says in that third Nephi scripture, notwithstanding they were not a righteous people, yet they were united in the hatred of those who had entered into a covenant to destroy the government. See, these people, man, the, the most dangerous group here is the second group. Because they're a group of people that think that they're doing all the right. Like the first group, they're crazy people. They're clearly doing all the wrong stuff. They don't give a damn about anything. They're there to destroy and tear down. It's like, it's too obvious for an intelligent person. You know that that's wrong. It doesn't take a rocket science scientist to realize that what they're doing is pure madness. You don't want to be part of that. But they're so united in the hatred against that first group that they're willing to overlook their own issues to go after them and go after everything else. And today, what we're seeing is this love for country and this supposed love for country and love for politics and love for the way of life and love for Babylon, that they are completely blinded by it and then they won't follow the Lord by his prophet. So, man, in the past couple of years, how many times, how many times, all day, every day for the past couple of years, I could have a conversation with any random member of our church and say things like, we need to just follow the prophet. You know, if we just follow the prophet, everything's going to be okay. And they would rail and whine and get angry with me and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But only if it goes with my personal revelation and only if I, I am told by God himself that I should do X, Y, Z. And only if it goes with my political stance, which I believe to be correct and true. And I believe that I have a right to do X, Y, Z. And it's again, it's all about war and guns and defense and having what they want and no one telling them what to do. And that goes for you, Heavenly Father and the prophet. So um, these people don't get it. They don't get that they are group number two. But for those that are striving to follow the prophet and they realize that being the remnant is it's a small group it's lonely it requires sacrifice it re it's going to require the loss of friends maybe family you, you basically have to sacrifice everything to be part of that group um <laughs> we see it you know we i just wish we could wake up more people in that second group in particular first group it's tough they're probably gone you do what you can second group some of them we can wake up, but a lot of them are so heavily entrenched in their war, their desire for war, their desire for politics, their, de their desire for gain, all this stuff that they will not open their eyes to the need to follow the prophet, to follow the council, to follow the commandments. They're not trying to gain the power. They're not preparing themselves. They're not going to be ready when lightning strikes. Lightning's going to strike and they're going to say, well, I could, but, you know, my politics, my, 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 my country. My war, my guns, you know, and the remnant is going to say, okay, we've been, we've been preparing for it. We're ready for it. Oil is ready in the lamps. The barges are ready. Let's launch. We're about to see imminent destruction. Launch the barges. Light the, light the lamps. The Savior's coming. Let's get in to the wedding feast where we will be safe. Flee unto Zion, as jo Joseph Smith taught. Only the remnant's going to be willing to do ready and willing to do that in that day. That second group is going to think that they're righteous and they're going to steer themselves straight into the eye of that destructive storm. And it is heartbreaking to see it because we're seeing it right now. There'll be people that are listening to this right now that may not be in the third camp. They may be, may still be heavily entrenched in the, in the second camp. Throw away your love for politics and country and war over the over the Lord Jesus Christ and following his prophet and prepare yourself for these things. Otherwise, when that sudden destruction comes, it will take you. Yes, it will. And the sieve Amen. goes both way. Sieve goes both ways, right? And it gets Left and right. And it gets people from group one and group two, but less much less from group one, you would say. And it sieves them down into group three. That's what ends up that's what ends up happening. So make sure that you don't fight it, you overcome your weaknesses, which is what Topher went over. 
overcome those weaknesses, become something so that you can fit through the little, fit through the sieve, fall down below. All right, we ready to go? This is this was a good one. This is a good one. Sad little Coriantumer behind us, but this was a good one. Poor, poor Coriantumer. Okay. And by the way, Ether was the only re the remnant. The remnant in that day, the few was oh. one. <laughs> so, so yeah. But the but there's all of us. There's only one of you, Ether, and he was right. He was okay. Right. Yeah, and he was right. So thank you, everyone, for taking the time to listen to us today, being part of Zyner Bust, being part of this experience, listening to the Three Brothers. We just feel so blessed to be alive in this day, uh, which when lightning's going to strike, we are just grateful to be alive in this day. We just hope we're ready. We're just trying to get ourselves ready, right? The days in which the Lord will perform his most wonderful works when that lightning is going to strike, because it's going to happen. These are the days directly before the second coming of our Lord and Savior. If it isn't clear by now, we're Zion or bust, or as many prophets of God have, have said, it's the kingdom of God or nothing. If you haven't made that decision, it doesn't matter where you're going. We know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's church. We're just simply doing everything we can do to prepare the world for the Savior's second coming, coming together, obtaining and developing the spirit of Zion, which will be pre prerequisite for entering into that building. If you're interested in, into that city, if you're interested in learning more, check us out on Discord or on Facebook. We provide both those links always above. And please share your insights with us. We, we Obviously, there's always so many good things shared by others in Discord that we, we really do enjoy reading. And, and here he goes. There's a lot of stuff in here. So take your time to join this. If you have some insights of your own and you would like to share them on Book of Mormon or Bust, that would also be great. Zion cannot, because Zion cannot be built without a group of righteous saints. You need us. We need you. We we need the group and we need each other far more than the group needs us. Right? We need the group. We need Zion far more than, than they actually need us. We need to always remember that, right? We need to knit our hearts together in love and and unity. We are your favorite. <laughs> three, three brothers. brothers. And it just asked me if I was playing music. That's how good we just sang that. <laughs> and we love you. Love you guys. <laughs>